chapter five of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter five political life lord wrexham was prime minister of england at the time when this story opens he was a bachelor for reasons which have been told elsewhere he was a premier for reasons which have not yet been mentioned the principal one of which was that nobody considered him specially suited and therefore nobody else considered him specially unsuited for the office when half of a political party is crying out to be governed by a and another half is shrieking equally loudly for the guidance of b it happens not infrequently that the lot finally falls upon c for the good reason that he is neither the one nor the other nobody is particularly delighted by his elevation to power consequently nobody else is particularly annoyed by it and so everybody is pleased all round or to speak more correctly is not displeased perfection of any kind never being more than approximate in politics of course many men owe their success in life to the fact that they are themselves but quite as many owe it to the fact that they are not somebody else which is by no means the same thing though to the superficial it may appear so lord wrexham would never have become prime minister because he was what he was he was raised to that dignity and honour simply because he wasn't what he wasn't isabel carnaby once nearly married him because he was not paul seaton she also jilted him for the same sufficient reason and it was this negative characteristic of his this power so to speak of not being other people that made it possible for a friendship still to exist between himself and her and for isabel and her husband to come and stay at vernacre had she become lady wrexham there would have been no friendship and no possibility of one between herself and paul seaton one might write a treatise upon the men and their name is legion who are neither a nor b but simply c they form a large and influential class of the community they accomplish much in life but by negative rather than by positive means they own more wisdom than charm more solid sense than strong personality theirs is not the magnetic force which sways men and subjugates women which at first sight either irresistibly attracts or unaccountably repulses but the staying power which commands respect rather than admiration the gentle reasonableness which convinces rather than compels these men of the c division of society make uninteresting lovers but unexceptionable husbands they can carry out an accepted policy better than they can lead a forlorn hope but usually they are honest men and good citizens and almost invariably they are gentlemen such a man was lord wrexham the prime minister at the time of this story the then sitting parliament had passed its zenith and there was no doubt that its successor would insist upon a thorough shuffling of the political cards the party as is not unusual with liberal parties was divided otherwise lord wrexham would never have been selected as its head there was no doubt that if the liberals remained in power after the general election a place in the cabinet must be found for paul seaton the under secretary of war and the leader of the more advanced section of the party and the inclusion of seaton in a cabinet meant to a great extent the adoption by that cabinet of the policy which he advocated as in addition to being an able man himself he represented a section of the party too large and influential to be set aside 
now mrs paul seaton was an excellent wife loving and reverencing her husband with her whole heart as a good wife should but she did not agree with him in politics she had been brought up in the good old whig school by her uncle sir benjamin farley and being a clever woman she had not just accepted with unquestioning simplicity the political tenets in which she had been trained she had carefully weighed them for herself and had not found them wanting when mature judgment sets its seal of approval upon the traditions of youth those traditions become fixed principles which it is difficult if not impossible to uproot as they crown with the sanction of later reason the sanctity of earlier romance a combination of almost impregnable strength therefore seaton's wife could not see eye to eye with him on these matters much as she would have liked to do so although in actual years she was slightly younger than her husband in her outlook upon life she was older than he women always maturing more quickly than men consequently her politics were those of an elderly man while his were those of a young one he had still the hopefulness and enthusiasm of the knight-errant who is always setting forth upon marvellous quests for the righting of the wrong or the succour of the helpless or the seeing of wonderful and unearthly visions while she had already learnt that the patching of old garments with new cloth often makes the rent worse that by endeavouring to right a wrong men sometimes increase it and that the time of visions is over past paul's certainty that he had discovered a panacea for most political and social and commercial ills and his joyous belief in the ultimate success of the same awoke no answering chord in isabel's breast she was just as anxious as he was that the country and the party should alike flourish she was considerably more anxious than he was that paul seaton should eventually become prime minister but she differed from him as to the best means for procuring these desirable ends she had unbounded admiration for her husband's powers unlimited faith in his abilities but she feared that his over-sanguine disposition would lead him to strike before the iron was quite hot enough and to attempt to seize the prize before it was in his grasp paul's chief end in view was the good of his country isabel's chief end in view was the advancement of paul and she was terrified lest in a moment of misdirected zeal or misguided altruism he should commit himself to a course of action which should eventually militate against his personal success she hated to disappoint him by refusing to share his enthusiasms but she hated still more to see him as she thought preparing disappointment for himself by building political air-castles as unsubstantial as the pageant of prospero from the bottom of her heart isabel dreaded the continuance of the liberals in power after the general election she knew that there must be fundamental changes in the government if the country decided on enjoying six years more of liberal administration lord wrexham's sitting still policy could not last through another parliament the new men with the new measures would come to the front and she shrank from the consequence of what this coming to the front might mean perhaps she was right perhaps she was wrong that is not the business of a mere story-teller to decide but she was convinced in her own mind that the changes which her husband and his friends were contemplating would if carried out result in disappointment to themselves and their party and disaster to the country at large and accordingly she longed to induce them to stay their hands failing this she hoped that the liberals would be beaten at the next election and so be provided with a period of opposition wherein to learn more about themselves and their country than they knew at present she had lived long enough in the political world to learn that there 
even more than anywhere else it is a mistake to do anything in a hurry but she had likewise lived long enough in the political world to learn that there more than anywhere else men are in a hurry to do things the old men because they are old and the young men because they are young the young men because there is so much to be done and the old men because there is so little time in which to do it but the man who takes his politics from his wife may be a good husband but he is not a great politician perhaps he is not altogether the best sort of husband either modern novelists may know better but the apostle distinctly stated that the husband is the head of the wife daily newspapers may take a wider view but the bible gives the wife no option save to be in subjection to her husband the husband has the right to rule by the most divine right of kingship and a king who is afraid to exercise his royal prerogative is hardly the highest type of king therefore paul seaton believed that in certain things politics included he knew better than his wife and he acted up to this belief in all uprightness and simplicity of heart they did not quarrel over the question they were far too good comrades for that but they held respectively their own opinions as to the best way of governing the country and of improving its outlook and they talked it all out fully together although paul was too much of a man to take his views from his wife ready-made there is no doubt that they were considerably modified by isabel's influence and no blame to him for that for even the greatest of the apostles who was himself a married man permitted that husbands should be won by the conversation of the wives so long as that conversation was coupled with fear one evening after dinner paul and isabel were sitting alone lady farley having taken fabia to the opera and were discussing the present political situation and the prospects for the future you are a faint-hearted fair lady said paul you haven't the courage of your convictions i haven't the courage of yours you mean it comes to the same thing isabel shook her head not quite well just you wait and see if we come in again at the next election of which there seems every possibility and if they give me a place in the cabinet of which there seems every probability we shall bring about such a revolution in domestic policy that the country will flourish as it has not flourished for years it will be the dawning of a golden age but again isabel shook her head you are always so sanguine the golden age has never dawned yet why should it begin now dearest you are growing very conservative am i i don't mean to but if only you are one thing long enough you suddenly find that you are another the difference between one thing and another being merely a difference in time if you go on being a liberal long enough you suddenly find yourself a conservative if you only go on being a high churchman long enough you suddenly find yourself an evangelical if you go on being a young woman long enough you suddenly find yourself an old one it isn't yourself that alters you stand still and the world goes round so that you inevitably get somewhere else by persistently stopping where you are silly little child just wait and see what the liberals are going to do and then you won't be a conservative any longer you must march with the times my dearest i can't i'm getting too old for such violent exercise but paul you always seem to think that any change is of necessity an improvement that new lamps are invariably better than old well aren't they new brooms always sweep clean and new boots almost always pinch paul laughed he was so sure of himself so sure of his convictions that his wife's warnings rolled off his back like water off a duck's underneath his somewhat staid and serious manner was hidden all the confidence of the self-made man while isabel's cheerful and careless light-heartedness concealed the half-cynical wisdom of the woman of the world 
darling he said with a smile your pessimism is very funny and so is your optimism when you come to that retorted isabel and then they each laughed at the other like a pair of happy children suddenly paul's face grew grave there is only one thing that bothers me he said and what is that darling isabel's love was up in arms for his succour and defence well the governorship of tasmania will be vacant shortly and isabel interrupted him how is that the graves end's time is not nearly up it seems only yesterday that lord gravesend was made governor of tasmania to comfort him and eleanor for losing the situation in new north wales when new north wales decided not to keep a pet governor of its own any longer that is so but gravesend's health is breaking down and they are afraid he will have to resign and come home before his time is up and if the liberals are still in office when that happens i am desperately afraid that wrexham will offer it to me for a minute isabel's heart stood still here was a way out of all her troubles and a very pleasant way too she would love above all things to be an excellency as her aunt had been before her and then if paul were busy governing tasmania he would not be hurrying in those measures for the improvement of england for which she did not think the times were yet ripe she considered that five years of colonial government would not only add to her husband's practical experience and increase his administrative ability but would also enable the english constituencies to become accustomed to the new ideas which the liberal party either in office or in opposition intended shortly to formulate oh i should adore it she exclaimed paul's face grew still longer i was afraid you would it was that which decided me that i couldn't refuse it if it were offered moreover i don't think that a poor man like myself would be justified in refusing such a good thing from a pecuniary point of view although i'm afraid it would be the end of my political career not it you are still a young man you can afford to wait at the end of five years you would be older and yet not old she was too wise to say wiser though the word was on the tip of her tongue still gravesend may be able to hang on at any rate until the new parliament said paul with his accustomed hopefulness and that would decide the matter for itself of course if i were certain that a liberal majority would again be returned at the general election i should be all right in saying no but if we are going out of office and i shall have to drop my official salary i don't feel it is fair to you to refuse this income and position isabel came up to him and put her arms round his neck darling promise me that if it is offered to you you won't refuse she was so certain that this would be the wisest course for him as well as for her that she did not hesitate to make the request of course i promise my own when she asked him in that tone there was nothing on earth that he would not have promised her end of chapter five chapter six of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Subjection of Isabel Carnaby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Chapter Six: Isabel's Views. The Secretary of State for War, Lord Kesterton, was dining with the Seatons one evening, not very long after Fabia's appearance in their midst. The party consisted of Mister Greenstreet, a rising author, Miss Vipart, and himself and the conversation as is usual in political circles turned upon politics there are no such people for talking shop as politicians there is no shop more fascinating to talk but in every world be it the political world or the literary or the artistic or the religious or any other world that ever was 
created there is nothing so well worth talking as shop and nothing that clever people are more ready and stupid people more reluctant to discourse upon there is something very weird and strange in the ordinary man's deeply ingrained horror of conversing upon the one subject upon which he is competent to converse he appears to consider it a virtue on his part to avoid as if it were the plague the one thing upon which he is at home and to descant at length upon those matters about which he knows absolutely nothing he is obsessed with a wild notion that he will become a bore to his hearers if he endeavours to interest them in those questions in which he himself is interested little wrecking poor deluded soul that he is in far more imminent danger of becoming a bugbear if he strives to instruct them in matters about which they know far more than he people are never really at their best except when they are talking about what is commonly called shop for it is only then that they thoroughly forget themselves and lose themselves in their subject even a plumber if he talked pure plumb would be well worth listening to he might enlighten even the most enlightened among us as to why he always leaves his inevitable white lead at home and has to go back again to fetch it before he can do anything and why he usually begins his day's work half an hour before dinner-time and might explain other mysterious matters connected with his own peculiar profession which the lay mind has long striven in vain to grasp but take him off his own subject and then probably he will be very poor company indeed and what is true of him is more or less true of us all it must be admitted however that women are less blameworthy in this respect than men principally because though frequently less selfish they are as a rule more egotistic they rarely shrink from talking pure and unadulterated shop especially with each other if the shop happens to be in any sense of the word a workshop all well and good the talker is usually worth listening to but if the emporium resolves itself into nothing more than a cook-shop or a baby linen warehouse well then heaven help the listener all of which brings us back to the starting point that the seatons and their guests were talking shop how long do you think we shall be able to keep ourselves in office lord kesterton with such a mighty atom of a majority asked isabel it makes life hard for the women and children of the party when the majority is so small that the men can hardly ever come home to dinner the men of the party ought to feel flattered mrs seaton isabel shook her head not if they knew the truth men would very rarely feel flattered if they knew the truth that is why really good kind women try their best to keep it from them a noble effort nobly sustained exclaimed greenstreet what is the unflattering truth in this case inquired lord kesterton with the smile which isabel never failed to evoke from him the truth is that when the men don't come home to dinner the women don't get enough to eat of course when we're dining out it is all right as we then not only get enough to eat but we can tell all our best stories as effectively and untruthfully as we like without having any tiresome husband at hand to pick the embroidery off but no woman can order a proper dinner for herself alone such a course is in direct opposition to her finest and most feminine instincts paul looked quite serious isabel this is very wrong of you he said i thought dinner went on just the same whether i was here or not ah that is just what a man would think 
to him dinner is the sort of thing that always must happen like the sunrise or the opening of parliament or christmas day but a woman loves to evade it if she can it is the nature of her to do so something in her make somebody once said that an ordinary woman's favourite dinner is an egg in the drawing-room and it is quite true i couldn't enjoy a lord mayor's banquet half as much as the dear little scratch meals i have on a tray in my boudoir before i go to the theatre when paul isn't here i have long noticed remarked mr greenstreet and marvelled at the universal passion of women of all classes of society for what they call something on a tray to the masculine mind things on trays are unsatisfying and repellent but to the feminine body they are as the very manna from heaven miss vipart he continued turning to fabia confess that you too feel the fascination of something on a tray i do replied fabia i confess it unhesitatingly i enjoy quite as much as mrs seaton does our little picnics in the boudoir before we rush off to the play greenstreet sighed i suspected as much bread eaten in secret is the favourite food of the normal woman it is merely another proof of her innate distaste for everything that is straightforward and above board not a bit of it retorted the host it is a proof of her innate unselfishness if only her men kind are properly cared for she doesn't care a rap what happens to herself hear hear cried isabel from the other end of the table i have much pleasure in seconding the amendment of the honourable member it is our glorious unselfishness that is at the root of the tray system no woman is capable of the deliberate and cold-blooded selfishness of ordering a full true and particular dinner for her own consumption why if you remember even eve couldn't properly enjoy the celebrated apple until she'd got her husband to share it with her and we are all like that bless our dear little hearts you are you are echoed the devoted husband and no one knows it better than my fortunate self it is always elevating said lord kesterton to hear the remarks upon matrimony by benedict the married man when his wife happens to be within earshot added greenstreet at a large dinner party it is interesting and instructive to note the difference between the conversation of the men whose wives can hear what they are saying and the conversation of the men whose wives can't there isn't much they can't hear if they want to said paul with a laugh the experienced husband doesn't trust too much to any apparent disability on that score for shame for shame mr seaton for letting out the secrets of the prison-house in this way exclaimed fabia greenstreet fairly groaned secrets good heavens she calls them secrets she thinks that the world cannot see the manacles of the model husband or else mistakes them for garlands of roses for an unrivalled power of sprinkling a few grains of sand on the top of her bonnet and thinking that she thereby successfully hides herself and her foibles from the trained eye of man give me not the much maligned ostrich but woman lovely woman all the same mr greenstreet fabia persisted i don't believe that men do see the faults and failings of their wives don't you miss vipart replied greenstreet well then all i can say is that seaton must be a very clever man you've been staying in this house for several weeks now haven't you yes five greenstreet looked thoughtful a very clever man a marvellously clever man 
seaton i have always admired your varied gifts but until this moment i never did you full justice isabel laughed with delight she had a great liking for mr greenstreet because he always talked nonsense to her and isabel was one of the women who revel in the talking of nonsense lord wrexham had never talked nonsense to her if he had she would probably by now have been the wife of the prime minister instead of only the wife of the under secretary for war and even paul did not talk as much nonsense to her as she would have liked he would perhaps have been wiser in his dealings with her if he had not always been quite so wise seaton greenstreet continued gifts such as yours cannot languish in oblivion a man with your marvellous slow-sightedness and your unparalleled dullness of perception cannot fail to end your days as either emperor of china or prime minister of england here his hostess interrupted him talking of prime minister reminds me that you've never answered my question lord kesterton how long is wrexham going to keep the party in office with such a small majority considerably longer than anybody else could do in his place replied lord kesterton that is all i can tell you why will lord wrexham keep the party in office longer than other people could asked fabia because my dear young lady he possesses all the qualities requisite for an ideal prime minister and pray what are they continued fabia pursuing the subject and pleased that she should if only for a moment have diverted the attention of the secretary of state for war from isabel to herself his first and finest gift lord kesterton replied is the solid absence of anything approaching brilliancy the great heart of the english people does not love brilliant men why not because my dear miss vipart it does not understand and therefore cannot trust them human nature rarely trusts what it cannot understand and how can a nation whose blood is beer and whose body is roast beef place confidence in persiflage or find security in epigram and what other fine quality has lord wrexham besides the absence of brilliancy fabia further inquired he is very practical and he has an admirable temper and is an admirable temper such an excellent thing in statesmen asked greenstreet most excellent was lord kesterton's reply as indeed in everybody else the statesman who loses his temper loses his followers the man who loses his temper loses his friends and what about the woman who loses her temper asked fabia lord kesterton bowed with mock gallantry there is no such person my dear young lady a woman never loses her temper some of them manage to do something singularly like it at times remarked greenstreet no lord kesterton repeated a woman never loses her temper she merely now and again condescends to give certain persons what she calls a piece of her mind and what is the difference between doing that and losing her temper the whole difference in the world my dear miss vipart the difference between an involuntary loss and a votive offering between the payment of a water rate and a libation to the gods between having one's pocket picked and giving at a collection added isabel and between compulsory taxation and the revenues of the s p c k precisely agreed lord kesterton and what other qualities entitle lord wrexham to be an ideal prime minister fabia went on he invariably says the obvious thing and whenever it is possible does nothing at all 
the great art of popular instruction is to teach people what they already know just as the great secret of successful leadership is to learn how to stand absolutely still and what else asked paul who was enjoying this disquisition upon his leader he is very prudent and he is very protestant and prudence and protestantism are the two great cornerstones of english national life and very good cornerstones too added paul it seems to me remarked fabia that an ideal prime minister must have all the virtues that begin with p he must be prudent and patient and practical and protestant isabel gave a deep sigh i don't think you'll ever be an ideal prime minister paul because you're not very patient and you're not at all prudent and you never say the obvious thing unless it is the thing that is obviously too good to be true paul endeavoured to clear himself well anyway i'm protestant enough he said in self-justification isabel sighed again yes you are charmingly protestant but i'm not sure that that is enough in itself though of course it is a great deal then she put her head on one side and looked at her husband through her eyelashes as if he were some work of art that she was appraising i love my love with a p because he is protestant i hate him because he is progressive he lives in prince's gardens lives upon platitudes his name is paul and i'll give him the premiership for a keepsake paul smiled but he winced a little underneath the smile isabel was sometimes so terribly accurate in hitting the nail precisely in the middle of its head my wife is always reproving me for being unpractical and idealistic he said turning to lord kesterton is she indeed then you will do well to listen to her seaton men who are married never lack the opportunity of hearing the truth about themselves and if they are wise men they will sometimes avail themselves of it hear hear applauded isabel but with all due deference to my wife and the other members of his majesty's government i cannot give up my belief that it is enthusiasm that really makes the world go round i cannot forswear my creed that it is in what you call idealism that the hope for the future of the race and the nation lies surely it is by appealing to the highest in human nature that we evoke the highest it is by treating men as reasonable beings that we make them reasonable beings it is by regarding them as heroes that we enable them to attain to heroism lord kesterton nodded his head two or three times perhaps was all he said paul went on i think all you wise and prudent people make one initial mistake you confuse cause and effect you believe that men must be trained to bear responsibility before they can be trusted with responsibility that they must become good citizens before they can act as good citizens in short that they must never be allowed to wet their feet until they have learned to swim it would save a good many lives from drowning if that rule were carried out murmured isabel sotto voce but her husband did not hear her she did not intend that he should now i maintain he continued his usually grave face alight with enthusiasm that you are putting the cart before the horse i hold that it is only by being entrusted with responsibility that men learn how to use responsibility that it is only by reading that a man learns how to read that it is only by walking that a child learns how to walk i do not believe that men perform heroic deeds because they are heroes i believe that they finally become heroes because they have got into the habit 
of performing heroic deeds our actions are not the outcome of our characters it is our characters that are the results of our actions a king is not a king because he knows how to rule he knows how to rule because he is a king then your idea is said kesterton not that we must withhold power from any section of the people until we believe they are fit to be entrusted with power but we must entrust them with it in order to make them fit exactly replied paul and i further believe that the more power the people have the more wisely they will use it that the more implicitly we trust them the more fit they will show themselves to be implicitly trusted you believe in human nature more than isabel does said fabia but he doesn't love it any thing like as much retorted the maligned hostess he begins believing that every woman is an angel and every man a hero and then when the angel begins to scold and the hero flies in terror to his club for refuge paul is utterly disgusted and washes his hands of the pair for ever now i know that at heart every man is a coward and every woman a shrew and i like them all the better for it and it makes them seem more like relations of ours with a strong family likeness it is rather a hard saying on your part to call every man a coward objected lord kesterton much amused no it isn't on the contrary it proves that i am able fully to appreciate them when they do perform heroic deeds if a hero behaves like a hero there is nothing in it he can't help behaving like a hero any more than a sewing machine can help behaving like a sewing machine or an umbrella can help behaving like an umbrella but if a coward suddenly behave like a hero it is something very splendid and wonderful indeed just as it would be if an umbrella in an emergency ran up a seam or if a sewing machine spread sheltering wings to ward off the rain the soundness of your reasoning is only surpassed by the striking nature of your metaphors murmured greenstreet isabel continued naturally then i am much fonder of my shrews and my cowards who on special and great occasions behave like angels and heroes than paul is of his heroes and angels who in everyday life behave like cowards and shrews i always pity and love and am sometimes surprised into acute admiration he always exhorts and demands and is almost invariably disappointed and disgusted then cried fabia you believe that the coward who sometimes behaves like a hero is a finer man than the hero who often behaves like a coward of course he is he is much more human while his act is much more divine that is the whole point it is when people suddenly do things beyond themselves that the age of miracles begins and that startling effects are produced look at balaam and his ass and how awfully upset he was when she did what he believed she was incapable of doing and reproved him but do you suppose it would have had any effect upon him if instead of his ass it had been his wife who began scolding and objecting and begging him to stay at home not a bit of it it would have been just what he was used to and what he expected and would have had no effect upon him at all paul smiled fondly at his wife even if you succeed in convincing us that every man is a coward nothing will induce me to accept the dogma that every woman is a shrew now for my part remarked greenstreet i considered that by far the more plausible of the two tenets of mrs seaton's creed isabel laughed gaily therefore you must see that when a woman behaves like an angel 
it is all the more credit to her doubtless it would be but personally i have never come across an instance replied the author i have said paul quietly and such a striking one that it has apparently led me into the not uncommon error of generalizing from a single instance isabel blew him a kiss thank you she said then she went on all of which is very nice and interesting but it hasn't answered my question as to how long lord wrexham thinks that the liberals will remain in office until the next dissolution anyway i feel sure that if we were beaten upon a question in the house of commons he would take the verdict of the country before he would resign and do you think we shall get a majority at the next general election lord kesterton that i cannot tell mrs seaton it lies in the lap of the gods but one thing i can say i would rather be beaten altogether than continue in office with as small a majority as we have at present too small a majority in the house of commons is a source of weakness to any government i believe that we shall have a tremendous majority at the next general election cried paul a majority that will enable us to do great things you do not think your husband is right mrs theaton said lord kesterton as isabel rose from the table and he moved his chair for her to pass no she replied slowly as she looked with half envious admiration at the enthusiasm shining in paul's eyes i often don't think he is right but i still oftener wish that i could be as wrong as he is End of chapter six chapter seven of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter seven gabriel carr in a new and hideous vicarage built in a new and hideous suburb of london dwelt the rev gabriel carr it was not a slum if it had been he could have borne it better it was merely a highly respectable and unbeautiful spot inhabited by a highly respectable and unbeautiful population for several years he had worked in the east end and had fought face to face with apollyon in that valley of the shadow a hard fight it is true a struggle to the very death but a battle not without a certain dramatic force and reality which inspired the fighter with courage and strength then the bishop appointed carr to the forming of a brand-new parish in the centre of a brand-new suburb one of those staring yellow brick suburbs which are increasingly wont to disfigure the face of the earth in the immediate neighbourhood of large cities here gabriel worked as hard as he had ever worked in the valley of the shadow and was as ready to fight but he was forced to admit to his own soul that the work was less interesting the battle less exciting with a criminal class that publicly blasphemed and privately defied the deity he knew how to deal but not with a lower middle class that outwardly patronized and inwardly ignored him carr's new parishioners seemed far too smug and self-satisfied to need salvation at all and far too respectable and independent to accept it as a free gift if at all he felt that they would resent receiving even the grace of god as a charity but would expect it to be paid for out of the rates and that being so they had a right to it without the intervention of any priest or prophet whatsoever nevertheless so great was carr's power of success and so strong his personality he succeeded in doing a good work even in that unpromising locality
when first he was appointed vicar of st etheldreda's he folded his flock in one of those galvanized iron sanctuaries which are anything but chapels of ease in nature whatever they may be in name and there he and his people for several years suffered tortures from the frost of winter and the heat of summer by turns but with his usual unfailing energy he gradually collected sufficient money to build a permanent church and sufficient worshippers to fill it he believed that ritualism and revivalism are the only two forms of religion which have power to attract the masses that it is through the seeing eye and the hearing ear that the hearts of the uneducated are reached so that while to the wise and learned the visible sign is but the expression of the invisible reality to the unlearned and ignorant the invisible reality is the explanation of the visible sign therefore carr availed himself of both these handmaids of religion in the services of st etheldreda's but he also believe that though revivalism may plant and ritualism may water it is not in the power of either of these to give the increase results he trusted to higher hands and like all men who do their best and then leave the issue entirely in those hands he was not disappointed he succeeded at last at st etheldreda's as he had succeeded in the slums for even crass respectability is not permanently proof against the power of god thus gabriel served the lord in his day and generation and to use the old bible phrase god was with him i am going to have tea with gabriel carr this afternoon said isabel to her guest the day after the little dinner party in prince's gardens will you come with me certainly it will interest me to see mr carr in his own home and in the midst of his usual surroundings it will help me to understand the manner of man that he is i do not think we ever really know much about other people until we have seen them in their accustomed environment mrs seaton shook her head it won't help you much in understanding gabriel as his surroundings are not an atom like himself i didn't say they were or even think it and if you expect him to resemble those insects who look like twigs because they live among twigs or those animals who have white coats from dwelling in arctic regions you will be disappointed he lives in a square house built of dirty yellow bricks one of those dreary unornamented houses that look as if they had no eyebrows or eyelashes and haven't the time to wash their faces and yet his own character is not built of yellow bricks at all but has as many foundations as the new jerusalem and is of as rare and costly materials just so unlikeness may be as certain a result as likeness that is my whole point oh my dear you are too subtle for me not at all the whiteness of a diamond is as much the result of its environment as that of a polar bear is the result of his sometimes like produces like sometimes like produces unlike but both productions are equally results i suppose suggested isabel that the difference depends upon the strength of the environment two blacks must be very black indeed before they can make a white no it depends upon the nature of the thing itself fabia answered rather shortly isabel's habit of speaking lightly and half mockingly about everything always irritated her she took life and herself seriously and was as yet too young to have learnt how nearly akin are tears and laughter she did not know that smiles are oftener a surer symptom than tears of a tender and understanding heart but isabel pursued her way unabashed i see no amount of fervent heat would turn a piece of carbon into a polar bear while the most intense and microbe-destroying frost wouldn't change a polar bear into a diamond tiara 
the raw material differing in the two cases it's like the difference between exports and imports one is one and the other is the other and it is a mortal sin against political economy to confound the two but what is really the difference between them i've never been able to understand fabia's lip curled slightly ignorance of any kind was contemptible to her i should have thought that you the wife of a distinguished politician would have known a thing like that i wonder your husband hasn't explained it to you he has often that's why i don't understand it you will find my dear fabia when you have lived as long as i have that all life's mysteries are comprehensible but not its explanations i have great sympathy with the old woman who said she understood the pilgrim's progress and she hoped soon with the help of the lord to be able to understand the key i always understand everything until it is explained to me and then i never understand it again as long as i live fabia did not speak but silently marvelled how could any woman thus positively glory in apparent ignorance and stupidity and a woman too so naturally sharp and clever as isabel if she had found herself on any point wanting in knowledge or intelligence she would never have given herself away by openly admitting it but isabel took the world at large into her confidence with regard to her own deficiencies but this again though fabia did not know it was merely a consequence of the red cord for instance isabel rattled on i used to understand perfectly the difference between exports and imports i said to myself the one goes out and the other comes in and that seemed as plain as the nose on your face which by the way on yours is a singularly pretty one but then paul must take it into his head to expound to me that what went in at one ear so to speak came out at the other and was changed from an import to an export in the process and from that moment i was lost i never again understood the difference between an export and an import and i never shall fabia wondered whether isabel knew she was a fool when she talked like this she did not grasp that it was because isabel knew she was no fool and knew that her world knew it also that she amused herself and it by sometimes behaving as one in the same way the latter continued i used to understand perfectly whether the twentieth century was to begin with the year nineteen hundred or the year nineteen hundred and one until the day paul explained it to me by taking a hundred apples out of one basket and putting them into another and from that day to this i've never known when the twentieth century would begin or whether it would ever begin at all but we were talking about mr carr suggested fabia so we were how clever of you to remember to know what one is talking about is one of the highest forms of intelligence well will you come and have tea with him this afternoon or will you not it is purely optional not compulsory as education is and as adult vaccination ought to be i have already told you that i will i shall be immensely interested to see mr carr in that house of his own which you have assured me is so unfit a casket for the jewel that it contains don't be sarcastic my dear men hate a satirical woman like poison and a sharp tongue is to them as a serpent's tooth fabia did not answer but she raged inwardly she always resented isabel's easy assumption of authority and superior knowledge and when as in the present case fabia knew her hostess was in the right she hated it still more and there was no doubt that isabel frequently was in the right a woman who has lived for nearly forty years in the heart of the world and has kept her eyes open and unblinded by temper or prejudice has generally seen a good deal after lunch the two ladies set out for st ethel's vicarage they soon left what isabel called the habitable parts of the earth that is to say those portions of london occupied by its more fashionable denizens behind them and drove through long miles of mean streets until they reached the dreary suburb where gabriel carr had his abode 
and specially dreary it appeared on this april afternoon when the rest of the world was alive with the message of spring at last they found their way to the yellow brick vicarage and were duly welcomed by its master there was no doubt that the vicar of st etheldreda's was a singularly handsome man his beauty which was the bequest of an italian grandmother being of that first-class order which impresses the beholders more with a sense of how fair is the soul that inhabits such a tenement than with a consciousness of the beauty of the body which that soul informs the only flaw in the otherwise almost statuesque perfection of his appearance was to be found in his hands which were more like those of an artisan than of a gentleman but these also in their own way bore testimony to the beauty of his soul for he had spoiled them by the manual labour which he had done as a comrade and an example to the youths in his parish he had worked willingly with his hands in order to teach them and help them to work willingly with theirs he had opened a carpenter's shop and had instructed them himself on certain evenings every week in all simple and useful forms of carpentry for the rest he was dark and thin of a light and graceful build and with a face expressive of intelligence and spirituality so ascetic was his type and so refined his style of countenance that he looked more like a mediaeval monk than a modern parish priest he received his visitors with many expressions of delight and conducted them into his bare and bachelor drawing-room one of those typical bachelor drawing-rooms which are so to speak full of the absence of a woman he might have flowers upon his altar but he had not one upon his mantelpiece there were none of those pretty knick-knacks about whereby women create a home atmosphere and at the same time harbour dust but everything looked as cold and clean and unlived in as a bedroom that is prepared for the nursing of a fever patient the fire had evidently been lighted just long enough to awaken into life all the damp dormant in the room and it crackled to itself in that spiteful way which fires have when they think they ought not to have been lighted at all gabriel had only three photographs in his room namely the interior of his church and the exterior of his mother and his bishop and even these had nothing in the shape of a frame to soften the severity and squareness of their cardboard cabinet outlines an unfurnished tea-tray was already upon the table but as there seemed little hope of its being occupied for some considerable time gabriel suggested that they should go and inspect the church to fill up the interval until such good time as the kitchen kettle should see fit to boil so into st etheldreda's they went and were struck as were all who entered that church with the difference between its plain and unimposing outside and its rich and ornate interior outwardly it was an ugly and unassuming structure but inwardly it was a perfect instance of how beautiful divine service may be when conducted according to the rites of that branch of the holy catholic church established in this kingdom gabriel was strictly anglican he allowed nothing in his church that was not permitted nay enjoined by the ornaments rubric he would have scorned to borrow from rome any outward form which signified no corresponding doctrine in the section of the church to which he owed his allegiance he would not even permit the children in his sunday schools to observe any act of ritual until they had first been taught the fundamental truth which that act symbolized he knew how helpful it oftentimes is to us who still see through a glass darkly to be reminded by outward symbolisms of the great truths upon our acceptance of which depends the salvation of our souls and it always will be helpful to some of us until the day dawns when we see face to face and know even as we are known but he knew also that while the ceremony which serves to recall and expound a truth may be a help the meaningless form which has no root in reality must always be a hindrance 
therefore gabriel was no mere ritualist for ritualism's sake but he prided himself upon showing what the services of the church of england really are when rightly and rigidly performed whatever of symbol and form and ornament this branch of the catholic church allows of that he availed himself to the full rejecting firmly however all mediaeval and modern accretions and superstitions and reverting as far as possible to the usages of the early and undivided church the beauty of everything within the walls of st etheldreda's appealed very strongly to isabel's artistic temperament hers was one of the natures which instinctively recognize the indissoluble connection between the beautiful and the true and which understand that beauty can never be a rival of truth but is rather an exponent of it upon fabia however the effect was altogether different hers was a more sensuous nature than isabel's and she therefore rated the intrinsic excellencies of anything in an inverse proportion to its appeal to her senses she believed that in this she was more purely intellectual than her friend but here she was mistaken it is no proof of intense spirituality when men and women regard as snares of the devil all the beauties of nature and of art but rather the reverse he may be a good man in whom the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh but he is a still better man in whom the flesh is so subservient to the spirit that the one expresses and typifies the other turning into a very sacrament every incident in daily life so that god may be all in all when gabriel and his guests returned to the vicarage the tea was ready that strong rampant tea stiffened with self-supporting london cream which many men and few women enjoy and the vicar poured it out himself i see you have chairs in your church instead of pews mr carr remarked fabia and i want to know why chairs are always considered more virtuous than pews they aren't he replied except in so far as economy is a virtue they are much cheaper that is my sole reason for having them they are nothing like as comfortable as pews said isabel because there's nowhere to put your legs let alone your umbrella and my umbrella ought to have a prize for regular attendance at public worship and do you feel you couldn't bring it to st etheldreda's mrs seaton there would be nowhere for it to sit on if i did that's why i hate chairs they are so cramped it may be the right thing to be content to fill a little space as the hymn writer was but i am not content to fill a little space because i fill it so completely that there are no outlying districts where i can plant my gloves and my boa and my other et ceteras and that is so very uncomfortable both for me and for them why don't you annex another chair suggested fabia oh that would look so horribly greedy and selfish i don't mind annexing a little bit of extra pew in fact i feel that belongs to me by right and on the same principle as a ditch always belongs to the owner of the other side of the hedge a sort of perquisite but coolly to annex a whole empty chair on which an immortal soul might and ought to be sitting i couldn't do such a thing at any price i have always been led to believe that it was things like that with a difference which brought about the french revolution then mr carr don't you consider pews sinful inquired fabia not at all merely expensive sin is always expensive but expense is not necessarily sinful and pews are harmless if costly pleasures and you don't object to people paying rents for them as so many churchmen do oh but i do object miss vipart object with all my heart i consider it contrary to all the principles of christianity for there to be any difference in the house of god there the rich and the poor meet together to worship the maker of them all and they meet on equal footing of dependence upon him have pews by all means if you can afford them but let the pews be free you've trodden upon one of mr carr's most carefully cultivated corns said isabel with a laugh 
that is so admitted gabriel people especially english people love to have something which sets them as they think apart from their fellows something which proves that they are not as other men or even as this publican they are never so happy as when they stick up a red cord somewhere and go themselves on one side of it leaving everybody else on the other i feel sure that most british subjects when they indulge in dreams of heaven substitute a red cord for those pearly gates which are never shut but the cord is fastened across pretty often and is only let down in favour of themselves and of such of their friends as entirely agree with them fabia was roused from her usual apathy at last she had found some one who understood i know what you mean by your red cord she said slowly it is very common very cruel and very english cruel i should just think it is cruel exclaimed the vicar it is positively merciless i think you exaggerate it altogether said isabel to me it is more amusing than anything else after all if a little bit of red cord at one and eleven pence halfpenny a yard constitutes human happiness why on earth shouldn't people have as much of it as they want enough to hang themselves in fact for the good reason that they don't hang themselves they hang other people mrs seaton to whom the operation is less necessary and more painful well for my part i like it replied isabel coolly it may be wicked but i do i love to see a red cord fall down before me like the walls of jericho and rise up again the moment i have passed through everybody feels like that it's human nature and if you try to make out that the israelites didn't enjoy it when seas and rivers made way for them and not for the canaanites and egyptians i simply shan't believe you and the israelites were considered very good people in their way gabriel smiled yes in their way but it wasn't the christian way you see and ours is that makes all the difference isabel sighed i forgot that yes i suppose one could hardly call them christians hardly mrs seaton gabriel was still smiling he knew isabel knew that she was far better than she made herself out to be far better than she herself had any idea of he knew that her half-childish vanity delighted in passing through social barriers but he also knew that more than half her delight consisted in being able to take other people with her she might have enjoyed crossing the red sea on dry land but she would never have consented to leave pharaoh's host behind she sighed again oh dear do you remember the baby in alice in wonderland that made a very ugly baby but a very handsome pig well i seem to make a very ugly christian but a very handsome jewess i am referring of course to moral beauty i am sorry to be so wicked but i do like red cords and it's no use pretending that i don't i believe the reason why i always enjoy the preaching at st margaret's westminster is because there is a red cord there licensed to hold only members of parliament and their wives i'll be bound you always want to take somebody else in with you said carr yes i do partly from good nature and partly because it is against the rules members of parliament are only allowed one wife even on sundays poor things and it does seem such short commons especially when there is a popular preacher turned on a red cord is just the sort of thing you would like said fabia with suppressed scorn i should have expected it of you then i am glad you are not disappointed retorted isabel i rarely disappoint my friends although gabriel knew precisely how much isabel's liking of this red cord amounted to he wished she had not openly praised it in fabia's presence as he felt sure that the girl would misunderstand her and he was right parish priests learn a great deal about human nature in the course of their ministrations it is a rule and sometimes a very unfortunate rule that we are apt in our intercourse with others to take whatever role they may in their own minds have allotted to us even if that role is unlike even opposed to our natural one instead of endeavouring to prove that certain persons are wrong when they are so in thinking us dull or sarcastic or flippant we become when in the company of these persons the very things which they erroneously suppose us to be 
sometimes unconsciously sometimes even against our will we are for the time being not our real selves at all but the creatures of our companions imaginations this may be partly due to a sort of false pride that will not allow us to justify ourselves when we have been so misjudged but probably more to the effect of mind upon mind by expecting us to have certain qualities these people temporarily endow us with those qualities and we actually are dull or sarcastic or flippant when in their society therefore it behooves us all to think the best and to expect the highest of each other until the charity which believeth all things and hopeth all things shall at last see faith and hope lost in full fruition yes you have never felt the lash of the red cord mrs seaton said carr gently you have always been on the right side of it and isabel laughed carelessly the people who take things for granted never know quite how hard life is to the people who do not well at any rate you can't have much of the questionable material in a place like this that's one comfort for you can't i though that's all you know about it why it is one of my greatest stumbling-blocks and it is always getting in the way and tripping up my people in their road to heaven don't imagine for a moment that the sin of exclusiveness is confined to the upper classes in fact no sin is the devil may have his faults but he is no snob i am sorry to say i only wish he were it would make work in the unfashionable parishes far easier than it is for the clergy but i should have thought that the people here were all on the same dead level like their houses said isabel not a bit of it they appear so to us i admit but doubtless we appear so to the angels it is merely a question of perspective when i first came here in the fullness and innocence of my heart i invited a few of the leading parishioners to tea i thought it would bring them closer together and so it did too close i discovered that there were deep and impassable social gulfs yawning between apparently co-equal retail tradesmen they bitterly complained that not only was it distasteful to sit at meat with social inferiors but after that after thus sitting together they could hardly give each other the pass by in the street but were compelled to move to one another thenceforward and to move to any one evidently entails serious social responsibilities which must not wantonly or inadvisedly be taken in hand gabriel asked miss vipart to sing to us said isabel rising from her chair and opening the piano gabriel's one and only luxury i'm sure she will if you ask her prettily it was one of mrs seaton's good points that she never lost an opportunity of showing off another woman to the best advantage she did not know what jealousy or envy meant but fabia resented even this regarding it as a form of patronage and would probably have refused had not gabriel turned to her at that moment with a beseeching expression in his eyes adding his entreaties to isabel's personal attraction had a great effect upon fabia it was only beauty in the abstract that failed to command her homage she would not be as conscious as was isabel of the beauty of a sermon but she would be far more conscious of the beauty of the preacher the one woman admired gabriel because he was good the other because he was good-looking therefore carr being a handsome man fabia did as he asked her just as she would probably have obeyed isabel had isabel been a beautiful woman it is an accepted theory that a woman's personal beauty is the surest passport to the love of man but it is a far surer passport to the love of other women so she sat down at the piano and began to sing and as she sang the reason of her loneliness and isolation became apparent for she owned that strange gift which is called genius the possessors whereof are always set apart from their fellow-men as she sang gabriel felt as if the heavens had opened and earth with its sordid cares and petty interests had drifted far away on the wings of that song his soul was uplifted End of chapter seven
chapter eight of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter eight vernacre park lord wrexham invited a small party of his special friends to spend whitsuntide with him at vernacre park his country seat which party included lord kesterton mr reginald greenstreet captain gaythorne and his mother the rev gabriel carr and the paul seatons and their guest miss vipart it was the saturday afternoon and they were having tea in the stately drawing-room a room for all its magnificence as empty of abiding feminine occupation as was the drawing-room at st etheldreda's vicarage mrs seaton would have preferred to have tea out of doors but she was too wise a woman to suggest it having learnt that it is not in human nature patiently to endure alien interference in domestic arrangements it may be very heroic to go forth combating error and redressing wrong in true knight-errantly fashion but it is far wiser to leave the error uncombated and the wrong unredressed if they happen to occur in other people's houses i am going down to the home farm after tea to inspect some model cottages that have been erected during my absence said the host would anybody care to come with me i should be immensely interested if you'll take me answered isabel quickly before anybody else had time to speak she knew that he wanted her to go and she wanted to indulge him it was only since her marriage that she had learnt to look at things from a man's point of view as well as from a woman's and had consequently realised how badly she had treated lord wrexham in the old days when she was isabel carnaby and now woman-like she tried to make up to him in the things that did not matter for having failed him in things that did because she had once denied him bread she now fairly pelted him with precious stones to tell the truth there was nothing that bored her more than farm buildings and model cottages but she was willing nay ready to endure any amount of boredom if she could thereby relieve wrexham's loneliness and her own conscience about the latter part of which attempt there was not it must be admitted much difficulty people to whom the world is ready to forgive much rarely find it hard to forgive themselves still more lord wrexham's face lighted up with pleasure i shall be delighted to take you mrs seaton i want to come too said fabia isabel looked annoyed she was fully aware of the fact that the lovely fabia had designs upon the prime minister himself and she resented it exceedingly we none of us really like the people who want to marry our former lovers just as we never really like the people who live in the houses that were once our homes isabel was beginning to feel much as frankenstein felt when his monster grew restive but charlie gaythorne unconsciously came to her rescue oh i say miss vipart that's a bit too bad you promised to come for a stroll with me after tea don't you know so i did i quite forgot it charlie reddened it is not pleasant to be forgotten by the woman you love and it is still less so to be informed of the fact before a room full of your dearest friends but this was fabia's mode of punishing him for presuming to remember what it had suited her to forget perhaps miss vipart will let me show her my cottages to-morrow instead said the host with his usual kindly tact fabia seeing that the bird in the hand had escaped from out of her grasp accepted the substitute from the bush with the best grace she could muster thank you lord wrexham it would afford me the greatest pleasure to inspect your model farm and at the same time i may be able to borrow from it some ideas which may be adopted on my return home to the improvement of my indian estates 
lord wrexham beamed there are few men who do not derive gratification from being requested to instruct a beautiful woman and still fewer who can resist the subtle flattery of being consulted upon the one matter which they do not understand in politics wherein he really was proficient lord wrexham frequently doubted his own wisdom but with regard to farming wherein he was an amateur of the first water he spoke with authority and without hesitation i shall only be too pleased to give you any advice or assistance in my power he said but here mrs gaythorne inserted her usual word in season she rarely heard of the formation of any plan however simple without making some attempt to improve it and this not from any unkindness of heart but simply from an insatiable passion for reform in the abstract i cannot think that the sabbath day is a suitable occasion for perambulating farmyards and inspecting livestock but why not dear lady why not asked greenstreet to my mind there is no more suitable amusement for a sunday afternoon no occupation more in keeping with the reposeful atmosphere of the day than to scratch the back of a pig with the end of one's walking-stick i always embrace such an opportunity whenever it offers itself it is so soothing to the nerves that it almost sends one to sleep on the spot there is something better to be done on the sabbath than to be sent to sleep mr greenstreet replied mrs gaythorne with some sternness indeed then why listen to sermons charlie moved restlessly in his chair he wished greenstreet wouldn't rouse his mother just when she was taking her tea so nicely and quietly and all was peace gabriel gallantly stepped into the breach surely mrs gaythorne the contemplation of god's creatures can never be a desecration of god's day and besides we are specially told that if an ox or an ass fall into a pit on the sabbath day we can pull it out which surely means that nothing done to alleviate the suffering of the creature can ever be displeasing to the creator mr greenstreet was not proposing to pull an ox or an ass out of a pit he was proposing to scratch a pig mrs gaythorne was nothing if not literal and in so doing i should be relieving the suffering of another without any inconvenience to myself added greenstreet the very essence of modern christianity again charlie moved restlessly it was all very well to be brave he thought but to wave scarlet bunting in the faces of dangerous cattle is foolhardiness rather than courage besides continued mrs gaythorne as usual plodding steadily along a side issue oxen and asses are treated with great respect all through the scriptures they were both very useful and important animals in the holy land but no jew would ever touch bacon or pork she had a happy knack of frequently getting the best of an argument by saying something which had nothing whatever to do with the subject under discussion and yet sounded as if it had and thereby confounding her opponents isabel was thoroughly enjoying herself she wished that paul were here to share her unfailing delight in mrs gaythorne's conversation but he had gone for a long walk with his chief and had not yet returned greenstreet was slightly staggered for a second by the pork and bacon thrust but he quickly recovered himself i am always thankful i am not a jew for that very reason he retorted what would life be without the taste of bacon and what would your morning tub be without the smell of bacon calling you to breakfast you are quite right remarked isabel bacon is one of the things that do not taste at the time half so nice as they smell beforehand success is another and so is fame and marriage likewise no no mr greenstreet marriage turns out to be even nicer than it promises to be ah i see more like cauliflowers than bacon i think mrs seaton you will admit that other people's cauliflowers repel rather than attract when the air is filled with the promise of them and as far as i am concerned other people's marriages have the same effect you are condemning yourself out of your own metaphor retorted isabel you compare marriage to a cauliflower and you admit that cauliflower tastes much better than it smells i admit that 
it couldn't taste much worse then in the same way you'll find that marriage will turn out much nicer than you expect i shall not for i shall never make the experiment here mrs gaythorne again pranced into the conversation i am sorry to hear that you are troubled with the odour of cooking in your house isabella but i am not surprised most london houses are the same it is all owing to that ridiculous custom of building them in the shape of a well with the kitchen at the bottom like truth murmured mr greenstreet i beg your pardon mr greenstreet i did not catch your remark my hearing is not what it once was i regret to say no need for regret madame on that score when i am speaking it is rather a subject for self-congratulation on your part well as i was saying if you build your house like a well with the kitchen at the bottom how can you keep the odour of cabbage water out of the drawing-room quite easily replied isabel i always succeed in doing so and if one can do a thing oneself it is safe though humiliating to conclude that nine-tenths of one's acquaintance can do it equally well mrs gaythorne looked sternly reproachful isabella how can you say there is no odour of cabbage water in your drawing-room when you have just been complaining to mr greenstreet that you cannot keep it out neither it nor bacon dear 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 the young people of to-day are not as truthful as we were when we were young my dear father never allowed one of us to be guilty of the slightest inaccuracy in our conversation i remember he once punished my sister maria severely for saying that henry the eighth had a dozen or more wives when she knew for a fact that he had only six but dear lady she was right absolutely right from an artistic point of view exclaimed greenstreet your sister maria pardon me for speaking in such familiar terms of the lady but i know her by no other name was a born artist she was not mr greenstreet i was the artist of the family and copied flowers from nature in water-colours upon hand-screens for bazaars maria played the piano and frequently performed at village concerts with encores but she was an artist all the same from a conversational point of view every good talker must be more or less of an impressionist for instance if you say henry the eighth had dozens of wives you give the correct impression that he was a much married man well if you say henry the eighth had barely six wives you give the impression that he erred on the side of celibacy persisted greenstreet i do not approve of celibacy remarked mrs gaythorne especially in the clergy once again greenstreet staggered under the unexpected thrust and once again he recovered himself by clinging manfully to henry the eighth and maria therefore you see mrs gaythorne your sister conveyed the correct impression by using the incorrect words she expressed the idea that king henry married frequently which was the idea she intended to express i am sure that mrs seaton catches my point he added turning for support to isabel perfectly she replied on the same principle that a touched-up photograph is really a much better likeness than an unmodified negative which cannot lie mrs gaythorne as usual ignored the high road of the conversation and stalked fearlessly along a byway but it ceased to be anything so frivolous as a byway the moment that the good lady set foot upon it had she crossed by path meadow itself it would immediately have been converted into a solid high road i do not at all disapprove of second marriages myself she said not at all she spoke indulgently as if she expected everybody present to run out and contract a second marriage at once now that she had sanctioned the innocent pastime and where there are children she added i consider it sometimes a necessity there were children in the case of henry the eighth if i remember rightly said isabel with meekness in her manner and mischief in her eye so the poor man could plead extenuating circumstances there were isabella bloody mary was one of them think of having bloody mary for a stepdaughter i should very much have disliked it i am sure you would said lord wrexham but she would have acted differently continued mrs gaythorne if i had had the early training of her you mean said greenstreet that in that case the fires of smithfield would have turned seven times hotter 
than they did i admit the theory is not untenable i mean that in that case there would have been no smithfield replied mrs gaythorne majestically i should have put my foot down upon it at once here isabel and gabriel laughed outright and lord wrexham stroked his moustache to hide a smile but charlie could not for the life of him see what there was to laugh at he knew that he dared not have burnt a single protestant if his mother had as she called it put her foot down a favourite form of exercise with her and he very much doubted if anybody else queen mary included dared have done so either but other people did not know the weight of his mother's foot he did and all this time fabia sat silent not joining in the conversation at all she was one of the women who cannot talk except in a tete-a-tete by no means an uncommon type general conversation invariably sealed her lips but she looked so beautiful that silence in her was pardonable if not commendable every woman ought either to talk well or to look well though she cannot reasonably be expected to do both but if she does neither she has no place in the scheme of social creation and is only fit for domestic uses in isabel seaton the social instinct was very strong conversation was to her a game whereof it behooved every one to know the rules had she lived a century or two earlier she could have held a salon with the best as it was she was an ideal wife for a diplomatist or a politician to ignore your partner's lead in conversation was in her eyes as bad as to ignore it in whist to say the wrong thing as heinous as to play the wrong card to sit silent as unpardonable as to revoke in conversation she was a veritable sarah battle insisting upon the rigour of the game so now according to her instinct she endeavoured to restore to animation the conversation which mrs gaythorne had nearly trampled to death i am so interested she said in what you say about all good talkers being impressionists mr greenstreet i know exactly what you mean and fully agree with you but unfortunately it never occurred to me to put it as neatly as you have done lord wrexham looked at her in admiration how ready she always was to put people at their ease and how successfully she oiled the wheels of life wherever she happened to find herself seaton was indeed a lucky fellow it was a pity that a man with such a career before him as the possession of so brilliant a wife insured should throw it away for the sake of those political will-o'-the-wisps which have lured men and their party to destruction ever since politics was first invented so mused the prime minister he made it a point of honour never to breathe a word to anybody against isabel's husband he made it a matter of principle not to feel bitter against nor envious of this man who had taken from him the one thing that he had really cared for in life but he found it a great comfort to say now and then to his own soul that paul seaton was no statesman greenstreet's thin face lighted up with pleasure the approval of mrs paul seaton was a compliment which few men ignored i think i am right he replied i am sure you are put in gabriel carr and that is why very accurate people are always so tiresome my late rector was that sort one of the best men that ever breathed but so accurate and so anxious to make other people accurate that i verily believe he would have liked to correct st john himself for saying that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written at this point mrs gaythorne was heard to murmur something about belief in the verbal inspiration of the scriptures being absolutely necessary to salvation but fortunately she was so much engaged with a large tea-cake judiciously administered by charlie that no one heard exactly what she said and she was unable not from any lack of moral courage but for purely physical reasons more openly to testify to her acceptance of this saving truth until the occasion had passed by my horror said isabel is a person who relates an incident exactly as it happened because then it isn't worth relating at all 
carr fully agreed with her i have an uncle of that kind who always uses inverted commas instead of the oblique narration and you know how wearing to the flesh that is instead of saying my wife's sister told me she had a cold he would say my wife's sister said to me john yes jane i answered john said my wife's sister i have a cold by this time the tea-cake had gone the way of all tea-cakes and mrs gaythorne once more enjoyed freedom of utterance and did he marry her she asked cheerfully even the redoubtable gabriel was nonplussed marry her marry whom he inquired why his deceased wife's sister of course who else were you talking about i never mentioned anybody's deceased wife's sister mrs gaythorne the vicar knew better than to introduce so debatable a lady into any conversation of his own free will he was a lover of peace but mrs gaythorne was not easily brushed aside when she had turned a byway into a war-path and started upon it yes gabriel carr you did you said she had a cold and that your uncle himself told you so and what i want to know is whether he eventually married her not that i should blame him if he did far from it for my part i approve of marriage with a deceased wife's sister who i should like to know is so fit a guardian of the children as their aunt i always told mr gaythorne that if anything happened to me i should wish positively wish him to marry my sister maria i should have had such perfect confidence in her training of charles maria always knew when to put her foot down and did the late mr gaythorne share your opinions upon this vexed question asked carr with a smile no he did not approve of marriage with the deceased wife's sister at all i can believe it murmured greenstreet men are so prejudiced and i cannot think why he of all men should have objected to it continued mr gaythorne's widow reflectively because maria was the very image of me it would have been almost like having me back again it was strange assented carr with a glance at isabel's preternaturally solemn face very strange indeed but where i do blame your uncle continued mrs gaythorne once again turning and rending the unoffending gabriel is for talking about his deceased wife's sister's cold and making such a fuss about it and you can tell him so from me if you like it was enough to make the poor woman nervous and lead her to imagine herself worse than she really was there is no greater mistake than to talk about one's ailments except to talk about other people's isabel added yes isabel you are right it certainly makes other people nervous but i never knew anything like young people of the present day for talking about their diseases for my part i think it positively improper you consider there is indelicacy in the discussion of delicacy do you mrs gaythorne suggested greenstreet i do mr greenstreet in my young days people were not always turning themselves inside out for their friends inspection it isn't only the young who are guilty of this folly argued isabel i never meet an old gentleman nowadays who does not so to speak wear his liver upon his sleeve for daws to peck at modern complaints always end in itis continued mrs gaythorne i disapprove of diseases that end in itis still you must admit they might end in something worse said carr mrs gaythorne majestically ignored such ill-timed levity when i was young the complaints that people suffered from did not end in itis they ended in ache and nobody talked about them by this time she had slain the conversation even beyond isabel's revivifying power so tea being finished lord wrexham suggested a move into the garden the company went their various ways and fabia soon found herself alone with captain gaythorne in a secluded part of the wood strange to say his presence did not irritate her just then she had seen the expression upon lord wrexham's face when he looked at isabel and she knew from that instant that her own hopes of ever annexing the prime minister were vain therefore she was suffering from the combined pangs of envy and disappointment also she had felt herself left out in the cold ever since she came to vernacre a feeling to which she was accustomed but which hurt her more cruelly every time she experienced it and that added to her chagrin and misery 
so when captain gaythorne followed her across the lawn and into the wood she felt for the first time a sense of rest and security in the society of this big silent devoted man it was a comfort to find anybody who really adored her in this easy pleasant cruel english society love was the thing which her soul most passionately craved love given and received and she had never had her share of it true ram chandra mukharji had offered it to her in extravagant excess but she did not care for the adoration of such as he she was enough of an englishwoman to despise her mother's people and enough of an oriental for the english to despise her and love which she did not fully reciprocate could never satisfy her poor fabia life was too hard for her just then as indeed it had always been ever since she could remember mukharji wrote constantly to her and she enjoyed and appreciated his letters she knew that intellectually he was immeasurably charlie gaythorne's superior yet at the present moment the admiration of the brainless young british soldier was far more acceptable to fabia's wounded spirit than ram chandar's lifelong devotion she waited for charlie to speak with considerably more kindness and patience than she usually accorded to his conversational efforts and made up her mind to be what women call nice to him whatever he might choose to say for a time the two walked on without speaking they were both naturally silent people the woman because she thought too much and the man because he thought too little so there was nothing unusual in this and fabia calmly awaited charlie's utterance with the pleasing certainty that it would be more soothing to her vanity than stimulating to her mind though he was never clever he was invariably complimentary at last he broke the silence i can't stand that ass green street he said fabia was surprised it was not at all what she had expected him to say and she saw no reason for such violent hostility either as mr greenstreet had never paid her the slightest attention but she knew from the sound of charlie's voice that he was very angry indeed why not she asked he was making fun of my mother all through tea the confounded bounder didn't you hear him fabia felt as if a douche of cold water had suddenly been flung in her face so it was his mother's battle that he was fighting and not hers it was the old story over again they really cared for nothing in the world but themselves and their order these well-born english people even the simple and adoring charlie was an aristocrat at heart perhaps he was she answered coldly of course he was confound his impudence and i won't stand it if he tries it on again i'll kick him into the horse-pond wrexham or no wrexham i'm not going to allow anybody's guests to insult my mother and i'll let wrexham know it pretty sharp fabia hardly recognized the usually placid and amiable charlie in this infuriated young giant and it isn't as if there was anything to make fun of in my mother either he went on some fellows mothers are a rummy sort i admit but mine isn't of course some women do things that you can't help smiling at though it's shocking bad form to let their people see you're laughing at them all the same but my mother isn't that sort she doesn't do or say things that make a fellow even want to laugh at her don't you know i quite agree with you that it would be impossible to caricature mrs gaythorne of course it would said charlie mollified at once by what he took to be fabia's assent to his statement that's just my point now some old ladies are downright funny there's no denying that though that's no excuse for a man behaving like a thorough paced cad i think remarked fabia slowly that there is only one thing more aggravating than a man when he behaves like a thorough-paced cad and that is when he behaves like an english gentleman but fortunately charlie was too full of his own grievance even to hear much less to understand this enigmatical dictum for instance he went on i dare say if we knew her we should find seaton's mother rather a queer sort 
his people are nobody particular so i shouldn't be surprised if the old lady was a bit ignorant and old-fashioned and narrow and all that sort of thing don't you know and no blame to her either you can't expect anybody who isn't anybody to know anything can you but my mother is quite a different thing who was mrs gaythorne before she was married asked fabia in all innocence charlie opened his eyes wide in as unbounded amazement as if she had asked who queen anne was before she was married here was crass ignorance indeed then he remembered how fabia had once said that she did not know that his mother was saved which was even worse this was bad enough but not so bad as that not to know whence mrs gaythorne came showed an indifference to history which was highly culpable but not to know whither mrs gaythorne was going proved an ignorance of theology which was positively appalling charlie was too polite to testify openly to his astonishment at such a question so he merely replied she was one of the latimers of lusk and who are the latimers of lusk this was worse than ever but captain gaythorne pitied rather than blamed such astounding mental darkness just as he would have pitied rather than blamed her had fabia confessed that she did not know how to read or write they are the the well the latimers don't you know the latimers of lusk the latimers of leatherby are the younger branch of the family i see the latimers of lusk are the latimers of lusk and the latimers of leatherby are the latimers of leatherby of course and to think of a little middle-class beggar like greenstreet daring to make fun of one of the latimers of lusk i never heard such confounded cheek mr greenstreet undoubtedly belongs to the middle class remarked fabia he has brains oh i don't deny the brute's clever in his way but i'm glad you agree with me that anybody can see at a glance he is not one of us replied charlie in all good faith certainly he has a sense of humour that he has and it carries him a bit too far at times a precious sight too far when he begins to make fun of my mother and charlie returned to his grievance like a giant refreshed fabia moved her shoulders impatiently she had not come into the woods in order to talk about charlie gaythorne's mother but apparently he had and as is usual the slower mind had its own way at the expense of the quicker one miss vipart felt irritated and justly so it is always trying to a woman's temper if a man talks about his own relations when she wants him to talk about his relations with her now if charlie had been wise enough to propose to fabia on that particular afternoon she would have accepted him then and there and so would have saved certain further complications but charlie talked about his mother instead of proposing and expatiated upon that good lady's attributes until the time and the audience were alike exhausted thereby paving the way for another to step in and to win the affection which he longed for if he gives twice who gives quickly surely he who asks tardily often receives but half there are many esaus who only obtain the second blessing because they come and beg for it too late End of chapter eight